All right, so last part, unit you know, 15 and 18, is real estate specialties. This is going to cover property management, zoning, environmental concepts, um, and investment real estate. So a lot of this is already covered. We're just going to kind of hit the high points of this piece. This is the least tested section of the book. So you're going to have lower amounts of questions from here. So the bulk of the test was chapter part, part one and part three, in my opinion, right? Part one, part three. Uh, so we'll talk about investment real estate. So what is investment real estate? We want to make money off of these, these things, right? We have different types of risks involved. When you have an investor and you want to do an analysis, you're talking about what risk is there? How high is the risk based on how much money am I making? So risk versus return. Some people are more risk averse than others, so we need to know our customers feel on that, and we can kind of figure it out that way. So financial risk would be getting a mortgage, right? You're gonna say, what type of risk is this? Well, if we're getting a mortgage, there's financial risk because the investor may or may not have money to pay for it versus somebody that pays cash. So I'm very risk averse, so I like to pay cash for things so that I don't have to worry about defaulting on a mortgage down the road, right? Business risk is, will I get my rate of return on property that I'm investing in, right? Return is, how much am I gonna make on something? So we're gonna talk about risk types, right? Because that's, that's important, right? Risk types. Capital risk is, what if we can't secure additional financing? What if we run out of money, right? A lot of times when people are flipping houses, they run out of money. They're able to buy it and then they run out of money, right? So that's risk, right? It's capital risk, right? Regulatory risk would be something that the laws are doing to affect us. Well, now we can't sell this property FHA because it's over 100% profit. We have to wait six months, right? That's some type of regulatory risk, right? Inflation risk says, what happens if inflation goes out of whack and eggs go up to $8 a dozen, and now my lumber is $6,000 a board, right? It's like I gotta win the lottery to finish my framing of my house. Inflation risk means that. Inflation also says, well, interest rates are gonna go up, right? Interest rates go up because we wanna control inflation. Well, guess what happens when interest rates go up? The number of buyers that can qualify goes down, right? So that's inflation risk, right? Liquidity risk means, am I able to sell this property? Because real estate's really illiquid, right? So if you can't sell it, then you now have a risk involved because now you're gonna have to drop your price and lose money, right? So these are the types of risk. Leasing, we're talking about leasing. So there's different types of leases. There is, a standard lease for like houses, but then we have these commercial leases. Commercial leases would be things like a percentage lease. What is a percentage lease? A percentage lease means I have a base rent amount and based on my sales, I can now pay a percentage of my profits or a percentage of my sales as additional rent, right? That would be a percentage lease. So if my base rent is $2,400 a month and it's based on sales of $400,000, I'd pay $500,000 and pay 5% more or something like that. It would be based on the amount that you're over the $400,000. That's on 413. The other one that's really common would be a net lease, right? And we'll talk about a few of these things. Um, I don't think you're gonna see anything on expense stops. Uh, pro rata expenses would be you're paying your portion. Anytime you talk about prorations, pro rata, uh, or pro rata, if you want to pronounce it that way. Not it can family. be based sure. on the amount of your ownership of that space, the amount of the utilization of that space. Everything can be negotiated, right, based on tenant's percentage of occupied place. We have a gross lease where the, the tenant just pays a flat amount, right, with the landlord paying everything else, right? A net lease is the opposite of a gross lease. You pay the rent, 
and you pay however many nets. If you have a triple net lease, you're paying maintenance, tax, and insurance, for example, right? Um, you could have a quadruple net lease or you have a quint you, I don't know, a double net lease or whatever you want to do, quintuple, whatever they call it, right? Um, an escalator lease means that the base amount will be one amount and then anything that exceeds that, you could be charged a portion of it higher, right? So it's like a gross lease with a rider. If you have too much of an electric bill, we're gonna charge you more, right? Index lease is a lease based on whatever the current, say, consumer price index is, right? You might be using that. And if the consumer price index goes up, then your multiplier goes up and your rent goes up. Graduate lease or step up lease, this is one of those things like maybe they know that you're a startup business and they know that you're, they're not charging you market rent for it, right? Maybe they're charging you a thousand dollars for a small space and they know that you're gonna make more money down the road. So three years from now, we're gonna raise your rent to 1500 and three years from then, we're gonna raise your rent to 2000, trying to help you on startup. That's really what a, a graduated or a step up lease is. So those are interchangeable terms, right? It's built into some type of schedule. It's a long-term lease with a higher, higher end lease than the beginning lease. It's not the same as renewing your lease, right? When you renew your lease, they can charge you a different amount. A step-up lease is something that may be long-term that you're going to have gradual increases. Do I really need to explain new tenant and renewal tenant? Probably not. A new tenant is somebody that's in there the first time, right? Renewal will be somebody that renews their lease, right? We're not going to worry about that. Um, you see this here, renewal option, expansion option. Expansion option, renewal option means you have the first right to renew, right? Expansion option means I have the right to rent the property next door when it comes available. Does that make sense? So if the people next door wanted to rent this unit, they would get the first option before somebody else rents it. Right? First right of refusal, same thing in a sense, right? They have the right to be the first one in line, right? First right of offer means I have the right to offer before somebody else. Termination option means I can terminate based on whatever is specified in the lease. Uh, let's say I want to terminate my lease. I can pay a two month penalty, for example, right? Uh, lease types. Most, most residential property, you can terminate a lease with two months of Notice, all right? Now, something about transferring property that's leased, you can't just sell somebody out from under a lease, right? You can't sell a property and make people move out. You have to sell it subject to the lease. But there's always these recourse and non-recourse provisions, and we talked about exculpatory. You remember exculpatory? Sculptory clause is a mortgage that allows the borrower to surrender the property to a lender without personal liability, right? No recourse against the borrower except to take the property. There was a, where do, we, where do we see that? I don't think it's on this page. It might be under property management. We'll keep moving on. Um, what are we about structural knowledge? Estoppel, anytime you see estoppel, What's an estoppel? Estoppel is a stop claim against somebody, some particular party. So if you're transferring ownership, you have to get an estoppel letter, right? A payoff letter is a type of estoppel letter. An HOA transfer letter is a type of estoppel letter, right? That, those are usually done to stop some type of litigation or some type of claim against a property. Uh, we're not gonna talk about all these internet services and all that. Um, I don't think you're going to be tested on any of that stuff. If you are, I'll be surprised. Performance of leasement and encroachment. So we need to worry about any of that.
these financial investment ratios might come up. Uh, we already talked about operating expense ratio, right? So operating expenses divided by gross income is your operating expense. They're gonna give you two of the three, right? Debt service ratio would be your operating income divided by your annual debt service, which is your annual mortgage payments, right? Gives you your debt service coverage ratio. Um, one of the things I didn't one of the things I didn't talk about is they may test you on an amortized loan. In the beginning of the loan, more of it goes to our interest and the less goes to principal. They, they may they may ask you that concept. Um, and they may ask it backwards at the end of the cycle, there's more principal and less interest, they may ask that cycle. Um, and the question might be, in an amortized loan, and then the answer is, so it'll be a very general question, right? I don't need to explain price and expenses per square foot, right? Expenses over square footage, uh, rent per square foot, that all makes sense. Break even ratio would be, whatever your expenses are minus your reserves and then add your debt ratios and all that and figure out where you would break even based on your income, right? It's the same as doing an interest rate break even ratio. These are the things that you need to know. So financial ratios will be important. I think you might see a math question on that. I would say that the broker exam is not 10 percent math I would say it's more like 15 percent math because 10 questions is a closing disclosure which may or may not be math right so I would say more like 15 percent because you're going to see some of these ratios on it. equity dividend rate capitalization rate we went over that already net operating income divided by value is your capitalization rate the loan content the loan constant you're probably not going to see the loan constant would be your annual payments divided by your mortgage amount right your your balance of your mortgage, your original mortgage amount, right? That's gonna give you your mortgage constant. I don't think you're gonna worry about net present value. They don't return. We already talked about before in tax, before tax calculations, after tax calculations, right? They're gonna give you some percentage. They're not just gonna throw out um, numbers and tell you, good luck. You know, now they might give you before tax and they might give you after tax and, think, and you have to figure out the difference and find out what the percentage is, right? But you're gonna be given enough to figure out the answer. Um, when in doubt, just guess C or the longest answer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't always do that because you might not get the answer. Um, they're not gonna make you calculate amortization anymore. They used to do that. It's pretty much it. Investing in real estate is more about knowing what ratios are good and what ratios aren't. We talked about the main ratios early on. We talked about evaluating businesses. I think if you see financial ratios, you're gonna see less of it in this investment chapter, you're gonna see more of it in the business type questions. Make sense? Uh, the only thing we didn't talk about was static and dynamic risk. You might see that, right? Do you remember what those are? So static, static risk is associated with things that happen outside of property, right? Fire, storms, uh, somebody that fell and had an accident, something like that. Dynamic risk has to do with the economy, right? So static risk is mother nature type things, right? Dynamic risk has to do with the economy, supply and demand conditions, stuff like that. So they may ask you a question on what is dynamic risk? And sometimes they just say dynamic risk, and then they put answers, and you have to figure out what yeah, else. <laughs> right. Okay, so we're done with that chapter for the most part. Zoning and planning. Talk about CDD. We already know what a CDD is, right? We have the CPA, the Community Planning Act was used for development, right? Development, so this is where, this, all this stuff falls under the CDD. Uh, the term dedication might come up, right? Dedication is a gift of land, right? So I'll put dedication up here. Because a dedication is a gift of land for infrastructure of city streets, sidewalks, sewer systems, et cetera, right? Easements, lakes, tension ponds, preserve areas, right? Then that dedication comes from the builder. It's right. Like, it's not like right. a person. Right, correct. 
like that piece of property I was talking about earlier, so if that you, be a dedication? And why you, haven't they eminent domain that section? Which which shall? What, the one that the beach that they've been walking on for the last twenty years. It's not really required, uh, but I would say that the owner would give that to the county as a dedication, okay. right, and then get a tax write off for it, right? Uh, if you buy a development and you need 25% for streets and infrastructure, then that 25% would be a dedication. Right? Um. Zoning, zoning. So zoning ordinances were done under this planning act as well, right? Zoning can limit things like lot sizes, density of the area, setback requirements, like in this case with the one in Fernandina, if the setback's 10 feet and it's only 20 feet wide, you can't build anything there, right? And then 10 foot structure, three right. stories high, <laughs> they can't really do it, right? Yeah, density of the area, lot size type of structure. So a lot of times in a neighborhood, you'll see no mobile homes allowed, 1,500 to 1,800 square foot only. Those are zoning regulations, right? Uh, it also gives you regulations on subdivision. They do this thing called concurrency, right? Concurrency is the measure of the area and how much it's going to affect the infrastructure, right? Are we, do we have enough roads to manage that extra traffic? The example I used was building on this golf course. There wasn't enough infrastructure to build on the golf course. So there was a long time fight over how much we could do, right? And that, that's for subdivision, right? We can subdivide neighborhoods, we can subdivide that, but we have to add fire hydrants, we have to have lighting, we have to have sewers, we have to have all these other things added, so we need extra space for that. Subdividers sometimes will pay this thing called an impact fee. Well, guess what? The CDDs pass you through a bond. CDD bond covers these impact fees, right? So in some counties, they just pay an impact fee to develop a lot. In some counties, they get a blanket bond and they pass it on to you as a community development district. And they pass it on to the, the owner, owner, homeowner over 30 years, right? So when there's a dedication and when there's, a, we talked about dedication, when there's an impact fee and it's done by a CED, then we have to give a disclosure out called the community development district disclosure. Um, once we do the dedication and we figure out the impact fees and we figure out the lot sizes and we figure out the zoning and we figure out density and we figure out all these other things, the subdivider then sends this plat map over to the planning and zoning board and then they approve or deny it or ask for changes or whatever else the case is, right? Zoning, zoning board of adjustment. We have non-conforming. Conforming use means what? I can use the property as its zone, right? Single family for single family, commercial for commercial, et cetera. We have a legally non-conforming use, right? Means what? It means I was grandfathered in, right? I was here prior, I can still live here. So in the movie Up, where all the commercial development was around the guy, he was still able to be residential because he was grandfathered in to residential property because he was there first, right? So that's the legal non-conforming use. A variance is I have obtained legal right to operate differently because of, or under authorization under the appropriate government authority, right? So here it says, Two conditions must be met before you get a granted variance. Number one, it has to be a hardship. Property has to show hardship that will exist by complying with the new zoning codes, right? And then... Like if the property is in a residential area, but it's been a, a hairdresser forever. Well, that's non-conforming use because it's grandfathered okay. in, right? Mm -hmm. So variance would be very... Because... It says complying would force an undue hardship to the property owner. Two conditions must be met before a property can be granted variance. And number one would be hardship exists. We a hard, no, the hardship must exist. We have to show that, right? The zoning board adjustment must use the same established criteria to judge the validity of variances. So there's an example here talking about setbacks, right? So if the setback causes a 
a risk because of maybe a tidal flow, right? If the river is going to flow through, and we know that the river at flood stage would be in the house, then we would be able to get some type of variance, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to have a different setback, right? Special assessment, um, I'm sorry, special exception is, it says near a dentist's office might be granted a special exception if it's located near a large mobile home community where transportation is limited. So maybe there's no bus route or whatever the case is. It might give you an exception for different uses. So it talks about, under figure 16.1, talks about different things that uh, would be in according to variances or special acceptance, mm -hmm. right? Um, Plan unit development. Plan unit development is usually this big conglomerate of multi-use space, right? Mixed land use, clustered homes, right? We have apartments, we have single family homes, we have condos, we have commercial space, restaurants and shopping and everything else. That's usually what a PUD is, right? It has variations in special uses of zoning. Each area is designated that. We talked about community development district already. We talked about flood insurance already, special flood hazard area, 100 year flood plain, A and V, flood zones A and V require flood insurance, right? One percent or greater in a flood zone. So 100 year flood zone means I have a 1% chance of being flooded in any given year. I don't know if you're talking about Clean Water Act, you just know about wetlands protection. I don't think it's really gonna matter. Um, coastal management zone. It's governed by NOAA. Uh, this is where we're gonna be falling under that whole um, CCCL thing. So the coastal construction line is gonna give us requirements based on dunes and based on tidal zones and based on storm surges and all this. So it says here, CCCL provides protection of floors, beaches, and dunes while assuring reasonable use of private property, right? Anything east of A1A is CCCL property. And it doesn't mean the house has to be over the line, it means the property has to be over the line. Right, so we have to get that disclosure out. And it's not just, I mean, it's not any kind of water either. It's, no, it's only coastal. Right. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, if you pull the map, it's only coastal. Right. Or it's not all of the coast either. It's only certain portions yeah. of the coast. Um, so ILSA might come up, the Interstate Land Sales Full Disclosure Act. I would put that up here. I mean, we could put CDD, we could put CDD, we could put dedication, we could put C CCCL. All these things are possible to come up. They're not as likely. ILSA is very likely to come up. Developers must register subdivisions of 100 or more lots under CFPP, right? So ILSA, ILSA will come up. I promise you ILSA will come up. It comes up on every exam. Uh, developers of 25 or more lots must give this prospectus, right? This property report before signing the contract sale. So the two things you need to know under ILSA are these. Register 100 lots. And 25 lots or more, we have to give a property report. These two things are gonna come up. Hunter, they, they come up on every test. Just make sure you understand that. Anything under 25 lots are exempt from this ILSA Act. Interstate Land Sales Full Disclosure Act. You will see that. I promise you, you will see that question. Know those two things exist. Mm -hmm. All right. Environmental, that's you. You actually know more about the environmental piece than I do, right? So we have three different phases, right? We have CERCLA, right? CERCLA. We talked about this a little bit after the other class, right? CERCLA, the, you have phase one, which is just your, your overall view, right? Oh, we're in your, 17. Your, yeah, you're oh, dead. Sorry. Yeah, so phase one is your assessment, right? Your over. So phase two is your testing, right? Your soil testing and everything else. Phase three is your remediation, right? We talked about, mm -hmm. somebody actually corrected me on that. <laughs> but you know more about that because of the cell phones and all the other things you are doing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, CERCLA, it's not gonna get any more 
in depth in that. The one term that might come up is national priorities list. Um, I think more likely you're going to see something about potentially responsible people, right? Oh, yeah. Potentially responsible people, or PRP. Potentially responsible persons are the present owners of this contaminated site, the, the persons who have owned or owned it at the time of the hazardous waste being on that site, right? The generators of the hazardous waste, so is the company that's bringing it in could be responsible, and the persons who arrange to transport in and out could also be responsible. All these different people are potentially responsible parties, right? potentially responsible people or persons that could be required to help with the cleanup, right? So you can't just be negligent if you buy a property that possibly had hazardous waste. What if it was a tire dump site, right? You could be responsible as the buyer to clean it up, but the seller could also be responsible as well if they're aware of it, right? So it's always good to test if you're buying land or undeveloped land. What if you're buying the, the, the dump next door and you didn't know it was the garbage dump? It was closed for 20 years now, it looks like hills. Right. And we don't know, right? So then they had the Superfund Amendments Reauthorization Act. So the Superfund under CERCLA, right, was established to protect health and environment, uh, make the responsible people or these PRPs pay for the cleanup, right? So under this Superfund Reauthorization Act, we can possibly be an innocent landowner if we didn't know, right? If the party, third party caused the pollution and landowner didn't know it was contaminated, we had to make sure we did our right due diligence, right? We had to prove that we did the right thing to try to figure it out. Once the contamination was discovered, did we report that in a timely manner? If we didn't, then we could be responsible. Owner made reasonable inquiries to the, part, the uses of it prior to purchase. So if you said, oh, well, I didn't realize this was a gas station, did you ask, right? If you didn't ask and there's still gas tanks underground, guess who's responsible now? The new person is no longer an innocent landowner, right? So you have to do this thing called due diligence, right? Due diligence is checking everything out prior, right? You always want to do due diligence. Due diligence on residential property could be a home inspection, could be a septic inspection, could also be circular soil testing, whatever else you're going to do, right? Why do people not do that? Because it's very expensive, exactly. right? Yeah. So if they if they don't do it, it's because they're being cheap. But what they don't realize, the twenty thousand dollars they pay for the phase one two testing may end up costing them fifty million dollars down the road if they don't do the testing, right? right? And so fines and whatever. Sometimes it's worth it because you'll be fined per day, daily. A lot of times it's per diem fines, right? So. You have this national priority, uh, priorities list. It kind of tells you where the uh, published hazardous waste sites are, the ones that are eligible for funding, right? So it's prioritizing who's eligible to get funding for cleanup, right? I'm sure it's based on the amount of public harm involved, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. So if it's if it's like uranium radiation test site, it's probably got priority over somebody that has a gas spill, right? A right. gas spill, right? So that that's gonna be that. Brownfield says, brownfields are sites for expansion and redevelopment that may be used, reused uh, by the presence of potential presence of contamination. So, you know, it could be something like the old garbage dump, right? That would probably fall under the brownfield uh, regulation uh, because over so many years, they could potentially say this site's now safe, right? I think we've heard that. They, the one over here has sidewalks and stuff all over it. Um, here's phase one, two, and three. We'll just kind of go through it. it. It talks about phase one is just going to be the historical study, right? What was the site used for, right? All the paperwork type stuff, right? Title, title search in a sense. Phase two is going to be your testing, right? Phase three, we already talked about remediation. Um, then you're going to be given this. Uh, environmental impact statement or you're going to once a fully funded project you're going to have that we're not it's that's not going to come up but the phases might come up right the phases might come up on the exam um asbestos if you have asbestos asbestos was used until 1978 much like lead-based paint right 
if it, if there's a best asbestos discovered, then we have to that would be discovered in your phase one. We would have to get the right type of people out there to remediate that. Uh, you should have to have a license. I think you have to have a license. I think it says here. Um, asbestos really doesn't come up on the state exam. The two things that come up on the state exam is radon. Radon has to be disclosed in every contract. Every contract. Even if you don't have radon, you can't smell it as odorless, colorless, right? They talk about that and call this cancer. Uh, Lead-based paint is any house prior to 1978, it was built in 1977, you have to have a lead-based paint disclosure. And as a licensee, we have to disclose. As a licensee, we have to disclose, right? We have to tell people that they're required to disclose if they have knowledge of this lead-based paint. We have to give a 10-day risk assessment period to a buyer if they want, but they have the option to waive it. You don't have the option to waive radon disclosure. So we have we have radon, LBP, asbestos. The, the number one is radon, second is LBP. Asbestos is third. Uh, seller is required to disclose. Here it talks about exceptions to lead-based paint if the house is built after, after 1977. If the lease is for less than 100 days or if it's month to month, we don't have to disclose, right? This is for long-term type deals, right? Renewal of leases, we do not have to redisclose lead-based paint. We have to do it on a long-term lease, right? Other things that could happen environmentally, mold, Two types of houses in Florida, there's moldy houses and there's houses that are gonna get mold. Is there dock issues for waterway navigation? Is there a potential for, for sinkholes, which is pretty much all of Florida because limestone is soluble in our substrate's limestone, or Florida aquatic weed control, are we gonna have issues with that? Is it gonna cause issues for pesticide pollution or any of that? Those are things that we talk about, there's not really a disclosure on it, but we could talk about those things. I think there is a sinkhole disclosure. We just don't use it here because East Florida, we don't really have sinkholes. But Central Florida, you might want to go over that. And the last chapter is about property management, right? We have Landlord Tenant Act has three parts. We have self storage space for part three and residential tenancy for part two and non residential for part one. So, Landlord Tenant Act, it covers not only residential but commercial, right? It, it provides us a guideline for who's responsible for what. Landlord's responsible for X, tenant's responsible for Y, property manager's responsible for Z, whatever the case is. This is where you might have surety bonds come up, uh, property management requirements. So if I'm collecting advance rent, we sometimes have to have this third party intermediary, right? So they have the three options here. We can hold the money in a non-interest bearing for a bank account, right? That's the escrow account for the advanced rent, right? We can hold money in a separate interest bearing account and pay the tenant at least 75% of that interest. Or we can post it with the clerk of the court, but we have to have this total amount of deposits in advanced rents of 50000 or less, and that would be posting the security bond, the sure, sorry, surety bond with the court. Right, so that we can collect this and make sure that we're not going to run off with somebody's advanced rent and close our doors. It happens. Mm -hmm. It's basically a surety bond, it's like an insurance contract, and it's, it's like an insurance policy, right? So, um, don't want to get into all that because surety bonds don't come up very often. Just know if you see advanced rent surety bonds and it's 50,000, that's your answer. Right? That's what you need to know about surety bond 50k. Just like designated sales associates a million in assets, surety bonds $50,000, right? Terminant, so then we have tenants and uh, tenants by will, tenancy and sufferance, right? Remember all these things? Mm -hmm. So tenancy of will means I'm staying, I'm staying on my will, right? Yeah. Tenancy of sufferance means one party is suffering. suffering, right? So one party hasn't signed or they haven't renewed the lease, right? Um, week to week notice, you have to give seven day notice to move out. Month to month, no, month to month notice, 15 days notice, quarter to quarter, 45 days notice, year to year, three months. Now, so year to year, that's not 60 days, it's three months, but that's usually like for a commercial building, right? Okay. Most people don't sign your residential leases for year in advance. Okay. 
right? No, that's fine. I was just thinking about it. That's not ninety. That's not sixty days. Right. So whenever you don't pay your when you don't pay your rent, it's a three day notice, right? First thing you do is you file a three day notice. Once you do that, then you can start filing with the court for the eviction. Okay. Right. Uh, da, 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 removal of tenant. You have to go through the right processes. If you want to visit property in the state of Florida, you have to give a twelve hour notice. 12 hour notice to occupy unless there's an emergency, right? There's a major flood, something like that. You can go in as soon as you want. You don't have to give notice for that. Um, so by law, it's really 12 hours. 12 hours, but 9 but, p.m. to 9 a.m. is not somewhere. Most people give a 24 hour right. notice, right? Um, tenants do have rights, broker, broker property management. Um, so in order to remove your tenant, before we get to that, we do the three day notice and then we file a court proceeding and we get a judgment to take over the possession of the property. Then we take the, the courts over, sends the sheriff out and we evict the property or put them out on the curb, right? Uh, as far as property management, we already talked about the escrow account, $5,000 of property management escrow account. But if it's combined, you only have $1,000 right here. Uh, we have to abide by federal and state housing. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 is race only. If they say 1866 is race only. If they say Fair Housing Act of 1968, Civil Rights Act of 1968 was amended to do fresh corn. Which is familial status, race, sex, handicap, color, mat, uh, or Liz, I can't remember. Religion, national origin. So. I just said no vowel. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No okay. Vowel. I was like, I, I knew there was no, I knew there was no O. Like, I was like, I knew there was no O. I'm sitting here talking about, oh, it's so late, I'm tired. I know, me so, too. <laughs> I'm so late. So, um, you can record a lease, you don't have to. Environmental hazards, we already talked about, property management, we don't worry about affiliate on-site management. So there's different types of property management, right? Uh, a leasing agent only leases a property out. A rental agent only shows the property and rents it out, right? A property manager may be doing more, right? They may be doing maintenance requests. They, they, the scope of that has to do with what's in your property management agreement, right? So you can have on-site management like a hotel, or you can have on-site community association management, right? You have to have a license. Now, we didn't talk about that a little bit, but CAMS, CAMS, if you have an operating budget of $100,000 or more, or you have 10 or more units, then you have to have okay. a CAM, a licensed CAM, right? Talked about that. That might show up, even though we didn't, mm -hmm. somewhere we missed it. Yeah, I think um, it was on one of oh, the practice it's right exams, here. yeah. It's right here, actually. It's on the next page, I didn't know that. Um, oh, on four, yeah, 487. 486 and 487, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's right there, greater than 10 units and over $100,000. So we need CAM, CAM for great, CAM, greater than 10 units, greater than $100,000 budget. So a 40 unit place that has a $110,000 budget, you have to have CAM, right? 100 unit, 100 unit development with a thousand dollar budget, you have to have CAM, right? Question here says the community associations, more than 15 units or an annual budget of 75,000, is that true or false? No, it's false. It has to be more than 10 units or more than a hundred thousand dollars, right? But if it's one or the other, you still have to. You yeah, still I, have I, to have it. yeah, 487 page. Or line one and two more than yeah that's the notes I had on skills there. of a property manager I don't really think I need to go over the skills of a property manager uh, we're doing neighborhood and regional market analysis right to figure out what the rent should be uh, so you evaluate the condition and utility and it's pretty simple self-explanatory uh, type of property supply and demand how we're going to advertise we're going to signs and billboards we're going to do TV advertising or are we going to do newspapers direct mail and other things, or we can do word of mouth advertising. We can pay a $50 finder's fee to a tenant living there without a license. Anything more than $50 requires a license. Um, what's our delinquency procedure here? It talks about a three-day notice. We talked about that already. Um, I always do first month, first day is late, second day, or second day we're posting that notice so we can start the procedures. We can always catch it up if we want to, right? If they want to catch it up, we can do that. Uh, 
terms of party property granted, use of premises, maintenance and utility. So all these different things can come up in your lease. Who's responsible for lawn maintenance, for example? Who's responsible for gas grills? Or if you're late, how much is the late fee? All these different things can come up, right? Who's responsible for utilities? What happens if you damage the property? Who's responsible for the carpet? Is there a pet deposit? All these things could be in the clause, right? All these things can be in the lease. You have the lease to option to purchase. If you have a lease to option to purchase, then now we have to have a real estate license, right? Because why? Because there's a purchase of real, real property in there. So if we're leasing the option to purchase, it's a unilateral contract we talked about before, and we're preparing that we're not preparing the lease, we're preparing the contract, right? Mm -hmm. The attorney's preparing the lease or the owner's preparing the lease, right? So maintenance here, it talks about we're required to keep and maintain property, right? What does that mean? Do we keep physical integrity? Are we keeping it in good shape, the walls, et cetera? Functional performance, right? The landlord's responsible for keeping the roof from leaking, keeping the AC working, right? We have to provide a heater. We don't have to provide AC, we have to provide a heater, right? Uh, housekeeping, we're, you know, who's going to keep that clean? Is the tenant going to keep that clean or, or, or the property manager going to do it if it's an Airbnb, for example, right? Are we merchandising this properly? Are we advertising property? Are we putting clean carpet in there every time people move out? Those type of things. Uh, I don't need to worry about contract maintenance or that. Inspections can be done on a schedule. If you want to come in monthly and change the air filter, you could do an inspection while you come in and change the air filter, for example, right? Um, the whole thing about risk is we're going to transfer risk to third parties as much as possible, right? We're going to transfer it to the tenant. We're going to transfer it to the insurance agent. We're going to transfer it away from us to make it more profitable as a landlord. Mm -hmm. Let's check here. Yeah. Owner management relationship. Here's the thing with owner management relationships. The, the owner and the management company or property manager, they're going to come to an agreement. Based on the agreement that they come to is going to tell them what responsibilities are in order. That's really all you need to know about owner management. It's all negotiable, basically. And that's it for that chapter, and that's it for chapter four. Again, remember part four, sorry, not chapter four, part four, 15 to 18 is the least tested chapter, so don't concentrate too much on that. We didn't do a closing statement, it's kind of late. Do you want to do a closing statement? Okay, we're gonna stop here and